Testing one, two, three, four. He's talking. Testing one, two, three. Hello there and welcome once again to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're glad you're here. We're here each and every week visiting with interesting people and dealing with topical issues. And we got a guy coming in today that's right at the, uh, right at the top of the list. Indeed. Uh, we're going to speak with the speaker. Uh, Chris <laughs> Steele uh, is Speaker of the House of Representatives uh, for Oklahoma will join us. He hasn't been on before. We're pleased that he would give us his time at the beginning of a, what's going to be a very uh, busy and active legislative session. That's right. Speaker of the House, Chris Steele, today on The Verdict. We'll be right back. America has been here before, faced with daunting challenges, and we've always found the courage to lead. Foreign oil, greenhouse gases, we have the power to do something about them with American natural gas. Chesapeake is forging ahead, converting our fleets to clean burning natural gas vehicles, encouraging others to do the same. Welcome to America. Chesapeake, America's champion of natural gas. Wilsey Meyer Eatman Tate. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma working with the owners of small and medium sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. Wilsey Meyer Eatman Tate in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Welcome once again to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. Today we're really pleased to welcome to the set of The Verdict the Honorable Chris Steele, the Speaker of the Oklahoma House of Representatives. He's also the representative of District 26 here in Oklahoma. He's a native Oklahoman, did his undergraduate work at Oklahoma Baptist University, got his master's degree at uh, East Central University. Uh, he is the Associate Minister at Wesley United Methodist Church in Shawnee. He's in his final year of service uh, because of term limits uh, uh, in the uh, House of Representatives, and he's, finished, he's starting his second year as Speaker of the House. Mr. Speaker, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. We're glad to have you. As this show airs, the session is just getting ready to start. How will this year's session be different from last year? Well, this year, as you all know, is an election year, and so that always tends to affect the, um, the policy and, and the politics inside the building, and so I suspect that that this year will be uh, potentially be even a little more noisy mm -hmm. or noisier because of the um, because of the fact that it's an election year and then another dynamic that's going to come into play is that we we passed a law last year that actually would allow every uh, serviceman or woman who is overseas the opportunity to vote in in all elections and so in order to make that happen we had to accelerate the filing period and so instead of filing for re-election or filing for office after the session is concluded this year um, legislators and, and those who would want to run for the legislature will file in April mm -hmm. and so we'll actually have a, a campaign season going on during the end of session and so it'll be very interesting to see what the results will be. We know generally that our state and other states are in some level of financial stress right now, but the word has been that things are generally better and that the, the revenue side is doing better. Will that make your job easier this year? Well, in a sense it will, uh, and we are. We feel very blessed and we're, we're cautiously optimistic here in Oklahoma. Our economy is 
trending much better than, than the nations at this point and, and certainly uh, the economies of other states. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, we have utilized uh, a lot of one-time monies to keep our uh, budget balanced over the past several uh, fiscal years. And so I think at the end of the day, uh, we're probably looking at a standstill budget, but it's easier in the sense that at least we're hopefully uh, finished talking about budget cuts or right. other reductions at this point. So you don't anticipate going into the rainy day fund this year? No, sir. Okay. You don't. And so what that means is because you did it last year, even if revenue goes up, you may have a flat budget. So you may have flat spending even though revenue is better because you don't have those one-time monies to put into the, on your revenue side. That is correct. And so last year, for example, we utilized approximately $500 million of one-time monies mm -hmm. uh, that will not be available this year. And so if our revenue increases, say, by $500 million, then, then that results in a, in a flat budget or a standstill budget. Uh, in the House, the Republicans, of course, have a majority, and uh, you, along with others, are running into term limits. Yes, sir. Will there be a good number of Republicans be leaving the House, and do you see that having any impact on the, the majority or numerical majority that the Republicans have? Sure, and so I think this year uh, there are probably six Republicans who are, or five Republicans that are term limited. And then we've had some turnover just this last interim, this last year, we had one of our colleagues who passed away unexpectedly on the Republican side of the aisle and another one of our colleagues who uh, left uh, to go take another job, left early. And so we have two elections that are currently taking place right now. Uh, the numbers in the House for the Republicans, we were at 70 and because of the two vacant seats, we're now at 68. Uh, but both those seats will be filled prior to the end of this current legislative session or this upcoming session. Um, and I think that term limits are, are always will affect the numbers uh, in, in the body, but um, uh, we feel like that there's, there's good momentum kind of for our side right now, and we're going to uh, do our best to work hard and, and capitalize on those opportunities. Basically a two-thirds majority then. Yes, sir. That's, that, that's uh, it's, it, it's probably unprecedented. Is, has there been any time in the state history where the, the Republicans have had that much of a majority? There's not. This, these are historic times for the Republican Party in the state of Oklahoma. And what are you hearing from your membership about spending? Because nationally, it seems that the, the Republican Party is, is, is really trying to hone in on spending, and I'm assuming that same message is being delivered to you. Absolutely. Being fiscally conservative and responsible with the resources that have been entrusted to us is a priority of the Republican caucus and so we are constantly looking for ways to increase efficiencies within state government and as an example last year we were able to consolidate five different agencies that were in essence performing the exact same services in a way to try to make better use of our tax dollars as well as increase and, and provide better services for the taxpayer and so we're going to continue to be responsible with um, uh, the spending and making sure that we have a balanced budget at the end of the day while protecting those services that we believe are core services for the people of Oklahoma. Do you anticipate any more restructuring from with, with inside the, the state agencies? I do, I do. We're going to continue our efforts in, in, in the way of government modernization and trying to make sure that that uh, there's, there's no duplication and that the services that are provided are being provided in a way that is the most effective and most efficient and in the best interest of the taxpayer. What would you articulate as your two or three top priorities as speaker this year? This next year I believe that our top priorities will include um, a, a, a overhaul of our tax code. Uh, first and foremost, you know, over the course of time, the legislature has implemented a series of tax incentives, tax credits, and what have you, uh, for various reasons, and there's virtually no accountability uh, in relation to the, the tax credit. And so when I look at the tax code, to me, it looks like a block of Swiss cheese. There's all <laughs> these holes, these cutouts, and these carve-outs for different programs, and so we're going to do our best to implement some criteria by which to, to judge each and every tax credit that's currently on the books. And so cleaning up the tax code will be a priority. DHS reform will be a priority. We want to make sure that the Department of Human Services is providing the services in a way that is truly effective for those individuals who need those services. And of course, we're talking about our most vulnerable citizens, our children and senior adults in that regard. And then I also think that water and developing the foundation for a new water plan for the state of Oklahoma will also be a priority. What do you see there on the water side? Well, uh, we are we have diligently been studying the issue. We've we've um, uh, poured over the recommendations from the Water Resources Board, and so we hope to lay a foundation that will give our state the opportunity to enact a new 50-year water plan for our, for for our citizens. You talked about the tax reform. 
Um, safe to, to, to say that, that your party would like to see the state income tax continue to go down in future sessions? Yes, it is. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be uh, very methodical, very logical in implementing a plan that will allow us to phase out our state income tax over the course of a number of years. We believe that that will help make our state even more competitive in the mm -hmm. way of job creation and job enhancement and, and job growth. But at the same time, we don't want to do anything that's going to jeopardize funding for those core services that we believe in, things like education and public safety and transportation and health care. If you did a quarter percent a year in, in 20 years, you could handle that, I suppose. What, what type of, of, of incremental adjustments are you looking forward to? Well, it, that, the plan is yet to be determined. That's right. something that we're going to work on collectively as a legislative body in conjunction with our governor. Uh, but I think that we may see a, a, a quarter percent decrease over the next two years and, and um, uh, moving forward a, a similar model to, till we phase it out. <coughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me. As being speaker, uh, your day-to-day -day duties, how do you reconcile, not reconcile, but how do you manage to accomplish your pastoral duties uh, in Shawnee with being speaker at the same time? That seems like an awfully big... Uh, uh, challenge. Uh, I appreciate the question and I should note that my responsibilities at the church have changed. I'm no longer the associate, I'm now the senior interim minister for the church, so the responsibilities back home have even increased a little bit. Uh, and the answer to your question is I'm, I'm very blessed to have a, a staff first and foremost behind me at the state capitol and at the church that are working tirelessly to, to help me uh, be where I need to be and to fulfill my responsibilities. And so sometimes I feel like I get credit for a lot of things that other people are kind of doing behind the scenes to make it work. I would also say my wife, and, and, and she is just uh, second to none in helping me fulfill my responsibilities. So I have a lot of good help behind the scenes that, that make sure that, that my responsibilities are, are done in a way that, that, that they should be done. Chris Still is the Speaker of the House of the State of Oklahoma. We'll be back with more with Chris right after this. The thing that has made the most sense for me is realizing that I am still an educator, and that is what I do at the Chickasaw Nation. I'm Dr. Amanda Cobb Greetham. I'm a historian, and I'm Chickasaw. The Chickasaw Cultural Center is amazing. It is a very, very special place devoted to the sharing and to the celebration of Chickasaw history and culture. State-of-the-art technology, exhibits that are not like anything I've ever seen. The Spirit Forest is incredible and you feel as if you have actually just walked into a forest with huge trees all around you. It's timeless and yet it's sort of also representative of our time depth to really just sort of reach through time and touch the past. By the end of the exhibits, you really have a sense of Chickasaw cultural and political resurgence and the extent to which we are a healthy, dynamic, and vital tribe today. Chickasaws have always been an inclusive people. This is something for the whole community and for the state of Oklahoma. Every time our country imports energy, we're saying we've lost confidence in our own. But Oklahomans know under the land of the free lies the energy to be brave. Advanced technology has led to vast discoveries of oil and natural gas that have doubled America's supply estimates. Using one well to do the work of ten and half the time, we're proving that America's best answers will always come from inside our borders. Oklahoma's oil and natural gas industry, advancing our state, empowering our nation. When you have something important to communicate, it becomes clear that there's a lot of competition for your audience's attention. So how can your message stand out and actually resonate with your audience? Legal Graphics has the answers. The team at Legal Graphics will work with you to plan, design, and even test your presentation to ensure your message will be heard and remembered. Call Legal Graphics today to schedule an appointment. The readiness is all. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're visiting with the Speaker of the House, Chris Steele. So it's one of the most powerful positions in state government. Overall, how have you found the position of Speaker? It's been a tremendous opportunity for me personally, and, and public service at any level is, is an honor, in my opinion, and, and intended to serve others, to help others, to promote others. Mm -hmm. and, 
in having the opportunity to have served as speaker and currently to serve as speaker is, a, in, in my estimation, uh, kind of a once in a lifetime uh, chance to really try to make a difference and help our state reach its full potential. Well, there's a constitutional description of speaker having the majority party, but having such a dominant majority as you have right now, I would think that even increases the strength of the position. Well, you know, in some aspects it may, but, but I believe that, that our form of government is the best and, mm -hmm. and having the two parties in the legislature does nothing but help us uh, from a policy standpoint. And so we're intentional about meeting with uh, our, our minority uh, leaders and making sure that, that all voices are considered and heard in the process. Also, when you get a large majority like that, then your own party can start to splinter into subgroups. Are you yes, seeing sir. some of that? It, we are, and, and that also has been the case in other states where the majority has grown to a, you know, a, to mm -hmm. a certain level. Uh, democracy can and often is a very noisy process mm -hmm. and so uh, but I still believe it's the best form of government in the entire world and so that's um, that's all part of it is holding on to your own party is that is that sometime a uh, pretty time uh, time uh, honored it, it, it can be it can be <laughs> challenging and it can be time-consuming but at the end of the day I know that we're all there to try to make a difference and, and to try to help and and so I appreciate mm -hmm. the, the various points of view and, the, and the, the dialogue and the discussion that often ensues. How adversarial do you think you and your staff are with the Democratic Party? Uh, I, don't, I don't see it uh, being adversarial. We have differences of opinion, certainly, mm -hmm. uh, but we're professionals. And I think that there's a, a mutual level of respect and admiration for one another. And uh, we know that at the, at the end of the day, we're all Oklahomans first, first and foremost. And so uh, we were able to hear each other and consider different points of view and still work together collectively to do what's in the best interest of our state. Before you took over as speaker, I'm sure you had some idea, because you'd served in the House for a couple of three terms, yes, uh, had some idea about what you were getting into. Uh, did you find challenges uh, uh, in your first year as speaker that you did not anticipate? Well, uh, our system is set up in such a way that the speaker designate, whomever that may be, is literally elected a year ahead of time. We, we put that rule in place when, when term limits were enacted so that whomever would be serving as speaker literally would have a year to undergo a sort of mentoring process with the current speaker so that when the transition comes, it will be as seamless as possible. I had the opportunity to spend a year under Speaker Benj, learning from him, uh, spending time with him, so I had a pretty decent idea of, of what the job entailed. Uh, I had no illusions coming into the, the office that, that I would always make everyone happy with the decisions that I make. And so um, maybe just the, the, the responsibilities from a time uh, commitment uh, would be the things that, that were probably at the end of, you know, at the end of the day most, um, most challenging. When people talk about division at, at the state legislature, they talk about urban and rural, they talk about Oklahoma City and Tulsa, and then they talk about Republicans and Democrats. Sure. How, as Speaker, do you have to, to kind of weigh all three of those issues and, 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 and when you see a bill come down the line, you're saying, well, this is going to be interesting because it's not just R&D like, like right. a lot of people might think it is. It's a great question, and again, I would go back and reference a previous answer in that. That is, at the end of the day, we're still all Oklahomans first. I, I think my job is to consider all uh, aspects, all points of view, and then ultimately help guide the legislature in making the decision that is in the best interest of our state or the majority of individuals within our state. Um, and again, sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't, but at the end of the day, uh, the, the trick is to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to uh, voice their concerns and, and or share their ideas. How's been your working relationship with the governor's office? Fantastic. We're, I think that we're very fortunate to have Governor Fallon serving as the leader of our state. She has been very accommodating. We meet at least twice a week during session for breakfast and discuss the issues. The communication is she goes out of her way to make sure that we understand uh, the issues that are facing our state and to really listen and understand the issues that are being considered within the legislature. And so we have a really healthy um, working relationship and I have uh, the utmost respect and admiration for her. What did you think got accomplished in the redistricting process? Well, in the House, we took a little bit different approach than did the Senate, and I'm not being critical. It's just two different ways of, of going about the, the same task. And we tried to be inclusive. We, we made sure that everybody had the opportunity to, uh, again, participate in that process and, and to let their ideas uh, and, and their concerns be known. 
And, and at the end of the day, I really believe that, that we were able to draw districts uh, that, that truly uh, protect the, the, the fundamental process of our form of government, and that is one person, one vote. And so I'm, I'm very comfortable and, and, and confident that, that the districts, the new districts, mm -hmm. are, will be uh, in the best interest of Oklahoma. It, it didn't seem to be adversarial. You know, it was a not lot adversarial. of times when states start redrawing their lines, it, it you know, uh, all hell breaks loose. And well, I, and we've I seen that in that. other states this, yeah. this, this year. And we've seen it in this state in past, you know, sure, in past yeah, sure. decades, but not this time. And, it, and it's certainly an issue that has the potential to be extremely contentious. I credit a lot of the, the outcome to uh, the individual who I asked to be in charge of redistricting. His name is Dale DeWitt and he will be serving as our new floor leader in the absence of Dan Sullivan and he is a very even keel, uh, solid, mature leader and, and he goes out of his way to, uh, to include mm -hmm. others. There appears to be a pretty collegial, albeit somewhat adver adversarial sometimes, uh, relationship between you and the, and the Democrats in the House. Sure. And I suppose that helped, that atmosphere helped in getting redistricting done uh, uh, as quietly as it was. It helped. Sometimes, Not secretly, but quietly. Sure, sure. And sometimes I think they probably get a little frustrated with me, and sometimes I might get a little frustrated with them. But, but we understand that we're all there to do a job, and, and, I, and I know that regardless of your party affiliation, if you're serving in the legislature, if you put your name on the line and, and you're representing your constituents, that you truly care about them. And so we're, we're able to work together because of that. What about the American Indian Cultural Center and the, the, uh, the opportunity for funding coming from the state? Sure. Uh, that's an issue that we're still considering. There are several um, um, kind of sort of maintenance uh, issues that need to be considered that probably likely would require a designated sort of funding to, to truly uh, complete or to rehab. And so, you know, that's an issue that ultimately the body will decide. We have on the House side, um, distributed a questionnaire to every member and asked for their input on their priorities and, and kind of what their interests are. Uh, I personally believe that the, the Cultural Center has uh, the opportunity to be a tremendous uh, asset to the state of Oklahoma. We're very rich from a, from a Native American heritage perspective and, and I think to be able to promote that and share that with the rest of the world would be a, a really good thing. What will you carry away when this term is over? Uh, as your favorite memories as, uh, of course you got another session to go through here, but what will you carry away as your favorite memories as being speaker? My favorite memories will include the people that I had the opportunity to work with, my colleagues. That's the thing that I will miss the most. I, I feel uh, very sincere when I say this, like the, the, the most fortunate person in the entire state, and it's because of the people that I get to work with on a daily basis. The people that are serving in the legislature at this time are some of the best and brightest. Uh, in the entire uh, country and, and to have the opportunity to serve and interact with my colleagues will be the thing that I cherish the most and, and miss the most. All right, and what's going to be uh, that first week in, in session? What, what's what's going to be top of the agenda? Top of the agenda in the first week is, is just getting through the committee assignments. The bills will be assigned to the committee, various committees in the next couple of weeks or so and it's just really digging in deep and, and, and getting started with the committee process. In, ad in addition to hearing the State of the State address from, from our governor, she will uh, lay out her priorities and we'll begin the process of trying to you know, find, find out where we have common ground and where we may have some differences and, and begin to uh, work together to try to make this last session for me uh, or, and for the state successful. Well, we'll be watching closely. Uh, and speaker. wish you good luck. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. You bet. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker of the House, Chris Steele. We'll be back with more and a final word right after this. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. 
That's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. All children deserve a life of hope and love. But sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality assistance and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political, government, and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers We're wrapping up a show in which we visited with the Speaker of the House, Chris Steele. Yes, it doesn't hurt at all to have uh, the uh, ministerial training and, uh, mm -hmm. and talent to uh, supervise the uh, working of the House. And heaven knows, I'm sure they need some counseling from time I, to time. I took some notes during the show. Inter interesting that they're, they're still working toward the, the, uh, the elimination of the state income tax. And they're going to have to do it incrementally. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's roughly 5% now. But I think could, what Chris was trying to say is you, know, you take a quarter percent now and over a period of 20 years you can do it down. And, and you know, can you continue to cons consolidate on the spending side? Can you continue to do the types of things that this party doesn't want to do? They don't want to raise other taxes, but they really do believe in, in getting rid of that state income tax. It'll be interesting to see if they can get that accomplished. Yeah, that'll be a real, uh, real challenge to get done. And he also mentioned that in, in the last couple of years, they've been reaching into the rainy day fund, and uh, rightfully so. That's what the rainy day fund is for, is to try and help even out state budgets in the time of, of economic crisis. And last year, I think he said four or five hundred million dollars was taken from that fund and, and placed into the budget. His goal this year, though, is to not take any of that money from the rainy day fund and apply it into the, into the, into the budget, which means that uh, the state uh, revenue would have to increase four to five hundred million dollars just to have same level of services of a year ago. And that would be with no increases in spending from any of those departments. So uh, you may hear that, yes, spending is up. I mean, I'm sorry, revenue is up. And in, indeed, it looks like the proceeds are coming in. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to have more money to uh, expand government. And I think that's probably their goal. A couple of websites for you. More information on Chris at okhouse.gov. Our website, theverdict.tv. That's going to do it for this week's show. We'll see you next week. The preceding program was produced exclusively for the Cox Channel.